and it works, it's just a beautiful thing. <laughs> and when it doesn't work, it's just crap. <laughs> um, this is a, a team effort and I'm presenting on behalf of the team. I'm a social scientist, so my base degree is psychology, sociology, my PhD is family sociology. Um, I'm a heavy metal researcher, which means I do big quant data sets and crunch numbers. That's the kind of bag I'm in. Um, I'm passionate about that collection of data because in family law, um, often um, there's no data, so it's a data vacuum. And that creates a situation where anecdote reigns supreme. So the war stories kind of fly and there's no data to deal with those war stories. So most of the work I do is around collection of data and trying to kind of keep at bay some of these wild stories. And today in my 10 minutes, I'd like to just put up some slides which are in the papers and just talk through those because we're trying to work our way through this. I'm delighted that Duke has this paper. I think the paper will attract a lot of interest. Um, because there's so little data around shared time. And um, I was asked to go to the UK recently, I couldn't do it. My friend Brian Rogers, who's a lovely epidemiologist, went on my behalf or on our behalf. And he couldn't believe how little data there were at this big workshop on shared time. There was no data. And in fact, they were looking to Australia to get some idea on what their prevalence rates were, which I think is a really bad idea when you actually try to borrow from another country what might be going on in your own. Um, I'm fascinated, Linda Nielsen emailed me a couple of days ago and, and Bob and some others um, around Florida at the moment. I'm, I'm keen to hear uh, what's happening in Florida with a, with a bill that's apparently about to be signed by a governor that has equal time in the language of the law, uh, which is fascinating to see that drift towards that. And I, I'm about to tell the Australian story on this equal time notion. And um, yeah, let's, let's just see, social scientists um, have an unusual style uh, with conferences in that they wear a placard that says, kick me. Um, and so one of the reasons I like to speak publicly is to sort of say, bring it on and put some ideas up and would welcome to be attacked and to be kicked, if you pardon the pun. Um, I'll just fire this. Okay. I should just say, as context, in Australia, um, we have federal law, which is a really neat thing to have. So you do something and it affects the whole country. Um, except for child protection, which is state-based, and the problem, of course, is that kids fall in between the cracks because the family law says it's a child protection issue. Child protection says, no, no, it's a family law issue, and <coughs> through the crack the kids go. And child support also is, is um, federally based. So we've had a couple of uh, big changes. In 75, we had uh, no-fault divorce, and you see the big spike. People follow kind of trends in demography. You'll see the big spike. In 95, we had a change in language, which we borrowed from the, the United Kingdom around getting rid of guardianship, custody and access, and going to parental responsibility to residents. And this horrible word, contact, I always think of a plane and a propeller, contact. You know, it's a, it's, it's a funny turn of phrase to use around children. But in 2006, and you could call it thunder down under or the big bang, whatever phrase comes to mind, we've had the most, in 30 years, the biggest change of all. Um, and so the, the, uh, the legal change is now a presumption of equal shared parental responsibility. We had parental responsibility and the word equal got added around joint legal custody, so equal shared responsibility. And this idea that you actually courts and people around the courts have to consider equal time or substantial or significant periods of time with a couple of provisos. So equal time got written into the legislation. The other bit that's really interesting is that basically mandatory mediation got written into the legislation such that to get to court you had to go and see a mediator and get a certificate. And that certificate said you made a genuine attempt to try to resolve your dispute. Unless, of course, there are allegations of violence or urgency where you could go straight to court. So there are exceptions to that. Um, the catalyst for all of this is father absence. And, and uh, I've kind of cut all this out of the paper. But basically, around the world, one quarter to one third of kids don't see dad. Um, 
you know, the Journal of Law and Contemporary Problems, father absence is a, is a big problem for society in lots of ways. I won't go through that. It's a problem. I'm fascinated to see that policymakers go from one bookend, which is father absence, to equal time at the other end. <laughs> it's a really funny policy response to jump from there to there with nothing in between. Um, but the, the bit about the Australian story that's so interesting is that this isn't just a tweak with legislation. The whole system got turned upside down. So we had legislative change, we had new legal processes, which we talk about in the paper, family relationship centres, which are about preserving families. So it's actually these centres aren't just for separating families. If you're, if you're in a relationship and want to talk about your relationship, you can actually just go along and discuss relationship issues more broadly. So they're not kind of um, divorced places, so to speak. Uh, we have a new child support scheme. It's a very integrated system. And the fascinating thing about, you know, how did this happen? Because the UK is going through a big 50-50 debate at the moment, and it fascinates me because there's no money to do anything down in the UK. And I'm watching other places having these debates, and they, you know, on the back of the global financial crisis, it's a hard time to, to have a debate like this. But in Australia, we had a government who'd been in power for three terms, 12 years, and by their last term, they controlled both houses. Incredible power to basically ramp through any legislation they wanted to. Um, we, had a, uh, we still have a resources boom in Australia, so we had lots of money to throw at big, bold ideas. And finally, um, Dad's groups had the year of government for whatever reason, and gender politics have changed recently with a female prime minister and a change in government. The pendulum has actually gone the other way around gender politics in Australia. But the bottom line was they had this huge inquiry and at the end a backbench committee had a whole lot of dads groups come in and they got equal time into the legislation. It's a fascinating story around policy change and process. Um, so there are all these other things going on which we talk about in the paper. A whole lot of research. Um, I'm fascinated around um, something I call the mathematisation of time in legislation. Time as a number, or the, the legality of time. And a lot of my work over the last decade has been around the experience of time, about flow experiences, and the way in which, I think for a lot of dads who are angry about time, they actually just want a connection. And the way, because many dads have trouble expressing <laughs> this stuff around emotional connections, it takes on 50-50. But if you get underneath it, it's about basically just having a relationship with their kids, really, in many ways. Um, I've just won a... Um, when our legislation changed, um, many dads walked into lawyers' offices and mediator offices and said, I'm here for my 50-50. That was a very common experience. Um, I've just won a four-year fellowship to study the high-conflict shared time family. We know lots about cooperative shared time, but not a lot about court-imposed shared time. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about why, how I've run that. I've been speaking with some colleagues in Belgium. They had some reforms in 2006. And what they found was actually that people doing joint physical custody were more likely to be middle and high conflict families and also poorer and middle income families. <laughs> um, so I've been wondering about a changing demography in the sorts of families that do share time. And I, and I wrote a proposal and won four years of money to think about this. Um, and some of that money is paying for this trip, which is really nice. <laughs> Here's the thing that won me the money. Uh, the Institute of Family Studies, where I used to work, uh, did a content analysis of 300 court files pre-reform and after the reform. And what they found was in court orders where the hours were specified, a jump went from 4% of court orders to 34% after the reform. A very dramatic change. And when you have the bulk of the cases where the time is a bit unclear to work out what's going on, the jump goes from 2 to 13. So it's still like a 6 7% uh, seven-fold increase. These data have been picked up, I've been just written something for Oxford University with Belinda Felberg and Mavis McLean uh, down there and other countries are picking up on these data and I'm worried about how the data are being picked up and so I thought for this paper I'd go and get some more data and just see where we're up to. I should just add when you look around the world and, and I was a bit worried when I was speaking with, um, with Buffy initially, um, being the Aussie I didn't want to be too parochial 
So I've tried to make the paper very international rather than being Aussie focused. And if you work your way through it, you'll see I've spanned lots of countries to get a feel for this. Um, the going rate for shared time around the world is 14 to 22 per cent. If you look at, look at that, that's the range, 14 to 22 per cent. Some countries like Sweden, for instance, you'll get 33 per cent. Margot Malley and Pat Brown um, in Wisconsin, uh, when lo looking at divorce applications, they find 32 per cent. So let's get to some data which have taken actually, these charts are nice and simple but have taken a long time to build for a whole lot of reasons for people who muck around with data. Um, this is the Child Support Agency. About 85% of all separating parents end up with the Child Support Agency in Australia uh, because of the way family payments work. And the blue line here um, represents all cases, the whole case load, one and a half million. The orange line though are new cases, are fresh cases. This is a 10 year retrospective time series and um, the last lot of data I had, which were preliminary, went to 2008. And all you could kind of see was this line going up. And I was wondering how high the rate was going to go. But there's kind of a couple of bits to this. First of all, in 2006, when we had our shared time change, there's no spike. So that's kind of the first thing to note. In terms of behavioural effects of legislative change, there was actually no spike in the change in the prevalence rate. The thing that's a bit curious for me is there's two ways to read this orange, and I'd love to know what you guys think, is do you read this as a line that goes up to 19% as a, as a linear line that way and then drops off, or do you ignore the blip? This blip is actually child support formula. A formula changed, and, and to get a reduction in, in child support, a parenting time adjustment, it used to be 30%, it's now 14%. So the threshold got lower, which creates you know, greater likelihood of bargaining. I'd love to talk to you, Bob, about some work we've been doing on strategic bargaining over time and money. Because what we've found is that people think they know what the thresholds are, but they're actually more likely to be wrong than right. So they're bargaining amongst misinformation, which is a really interesting kind of finding. But this little blip here, if you ignore it, then the story becomes, once you get to 2006 at the reforms, the line actually plateaus. So there's kind of two interpretations here. We're not sure. Um, I showed this to an economist before I just left, and he looked at it and laughed, and he had a couple of interpretations. Um, he calls this a nudge effect. It's actually known in economics or policy terms as a disappearing nudge effect. That is, policy happens, there's a behavioural effect that's short term and drops away. You can see it in healthcare reform and other areas. So this is kind of a pretty interesting thing. He laughed because he said this, um, the family law reforms had no community education. So even though people heard amongst dad groups about it, generally the whole community didn't hear. But the child support formula had a huge community education campaign. We think that might have created opportunities to go back and think about shared time. People give it a run and go, hey, hold on a second. This isn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> and away you go. That's... <laughs> Here we go. So that's, that's the child support data. Um, and I've just explained that. This is survey data. So we've, we've got a, a very large project where we survey 5,000 people over time. These are sequential cuts. People who separate in 2008, separate in 2010, 2011. And you can see one in four had shared time. This group, it increased around the child support changes and then it drops off again. So same pattern. This is the big surprise for me. This is taking those same three groups and looking at conflict. So I've won this big fellowship saying, look at this jump from four to 34 percent on shared time with high conflict families. Give me some money to study it. Here we go, the data. And what we actually find is conflict in this first group was one in three. But actually, in the more recent cohort, conflict's only 15 percent. That is, people doing shared time in Australia are becoming more cooperative, not more conflicted. And there's a whole discussion to be had around that. Uh, and we have some ideas, we speculate those in the paper. But I think when the government see this paper, when we finally kind of let it out, um, it's actually the old government, the new government um, will be interested too. But this is a, a good news story, I think, for family law system change. Um, 
Okay, now we get to um, the high conflict or litigating sa samples. So we've gone to the family court, got some data, massaged it. This first figure um, is fascinating because we don't put it, it's not in the, um, the article, because I didn't want to cram the article with too many figures. But this is the caseload. And look at the numbers going through court. So here's, in fact, we actually had the raw numbers on the figure, but the numbers are quite big. When you get down to here, the more recent cases, hardly anything is going through the family court. So what's happening with mandatory mediation is all this front end loading is actually stopping the big surge right up front. Uh, we, we actually couldn't believe this. When we looked at it, it you know, our jaws dropped just to see the drop in numbers. Okay, so here's the first figure, which is uh, we've now moved to equal time just because the data we had, were, these are definitive and strong, but mucking around with 30% thresholds, we didn't feel confident. So this is equal time, not comparable to the other figures. And this is where a judge makes, makes an order. And you can see here, equal time, six, seven, goes up to 10 in 2009, and then drops off again. This is where people go to court to have the fight, but they actually reach consent along the way. And um, so actually, I, I want to go back one step. The big surprise for us here was that share time drops off, <coughs> but actually father residence increases. Um, this is court order. This is court order. And that's the last decade, everyone's talking about shared time. Ten years ago, people were talking about father residence as one of the fastest rising family forms. But father residence actually hasn't been discussed very much over the last decade, because all the heat's been on shared time. Mm -hmm. But in these, in these high conflict cases, it's like dads have gone, hey, hold on a second, forget shared time, I'm going to go, I want the kids. And that's actually what's happening in this high conflict group. So here we start the flat line. So still, by and large, mums get care of the kids. Equal time, one in five, by and large. Um, these are still small groups. If you put all these three charts together, which we haven't done, this is just consent order. So before people go to lawyers, the lawyer says you should go to court and just have this as a consent order. So there's no fight here, this is just agreement. This is the bulk of the caseload that goes through the court. This is a very clear picture. You can see these flat lines here of mum care, 70 to 73%, equal time, around one in five, and then below that, um, dad time. Bruce, I just wanna, um, we're not gonna have any time for questions to you and feedback. Um. We're done. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this paper, um, it, and I apologize in advance that I'm not going to do it justice because I feel terrible. Um, and so if I say things that don't make sense, that's, that's my excuse. Um, and I especially appreciated what I thought, thought was a really creative use of data from different sources to try to get at some of these specific problems and especially differences between parents in conflict versus uh, more cooperative parents. And um, so I really, I, I especially uh, enjoyed reading that. Um, I want to um, try to conserve our time by, by editing my comments now and not repeating, uh, if I can, some of the stuff that, that Bruce already mentioned in his presentation. Um, as he says, they're looking at um, a set of legal changes, mostly in 2006, with then some important amendments, I think, in 2008. Um, the key elements were legislative changes, um, creating a presumption of equal shared parental responsibility, if I have that right, not equal time, although it was misinterpreted in that way by at least some sources. You're not shaking your head, so I might, I might have said that wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, changes to uh, legal processes. Um, including community-based um, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, changes to services, um, and then changes to child support, um, some important amendments which were in 2008, um, which altered the, the child support formula um, in a way that the authors um, say could uh, make strategic bargaining over uh, shared time parenting more likely. Um, and then they use um, the data from three different sources to um, examine the effect of those changes. The first one was uh, administrative data from the Australian Child Support Agency. 
um, which represents, I gather, 85 to 90 percent of all um, separated parents in Australia. Um, survey data then that's drawn from a random sample of that Australian Child Support Agency caseload. And then administrative data from the Family Court of Australia, um, which I gather are the more difficult cases. One question I had for you was whether they are only difficult and complex because of the conflict inherent in them or whether there's something else about those cases that is also complex and therefore might be different from uh, the general pool. Um, so um, let me just go to, a, I guess, a couple of um, questions uh, that, I, that I had. Um, one of the um, figures that I found um, very interesting was figure four um, in the paper, um, which is um, drawn from the administrative data from the Family Court of Australia. Um, and figure four were those requiring uh, court determinations. Um, and I thought that was very interesting um, for a couple of reasons that you, you've already mentioned. Um, one was the low percentage of, of equal parenting arrangements. It's never more than 10% um, during the time frame of the study. Uh, there's the peak that you mentioned in 2009 through 2010, and then um, it drops off sharply after that, after, to, uh, after 2011. Um, and this, as you noted, corresponds to an increase um, in the with father uh, cases. Um, it does also correspond with an admittedly smaller number of with mother cases. Um, and so I guess one question I had was, I don't, because they're, that because both with mother and with father are both increasing, I didn't know whether I was completely persuaded by the theory that this has to do with, uh, primarily with fathers um, uh, fighting for custody and therefore, I guess, being shifted out of the equal time cases into with father cases. It could be, but there's an increase in, in both and it makes me wonder whether there is something more going on. Um, that might explain that. I guess, um, and then related to that, if it, if it is attributable perhaps to the um, um, uh, phenomenon of fa fa fathers fighting um, and receiving um, uh, time, um, then it would be interesting to have a little bit more analysis of which of the factors of the, the legislation or whatever's going on in that time period you think might be driving that, that specific result. Um, um, another um, question I, I had was whether or not there's any um, demographic information on these litigating couples that might be relevant other than just their um, higher probability to be in a, a, a conflict type relationship. Um, you mentioned at a couple of points in the paper uh, that shared time couples are different uh, from those that don't share time in a variety of ways including income levels and education levels. And it didn't seem impossible to me that, that parents who, who litigate um, have, are different along some of those metrics um, than the general pool, perhaps. Um, and that if that's the case, that might be um, having some effect on the results or perhaps um, dampening results that you otherwise might see um, in ways that would be interesting. And I don't know whether you have that data or whether it would be useful uh, to talk about it. Um, and then finally, and it, I gather from, from some of your discussion that this might be something that you're looking to for the future, I mean, a comparative analysis across um, countries, across jurisdictions would be really fascinating here. And of, of course it would be difficult because of the many, many other different variables that, uh, across those. Um, but as you know, a lot went on in Australia around this time. There's the legislative change, um, there are changes in, in procedure, changes in um, the investments um, in community processes. If there was a, a jurisdiction that had similar legislative changes without these accompanying investments, UK, it sounds like, might be a prime example coming up. That, that would be a really interesting um, comparison and might perhaps sort of give us some sense of is it, how much is legislation doing here and how much is, is something else. Um, and then I guess that was just sort of my, my last um, uh, statement um, or, or question. Um, the lawyers, of course, always want more discussion of the implications of, of your findings. I'm sure it, it, uh, it, it, it um, uh, rubs you the wrong way as a sociologist for, for us to want to know what are the, what's the big lesson we can draw from this. Um, nonetheless, that, that, that is sort of how I, I finished the paper. Um, as I read it, at least, uh, it seems that one could at least make the case that at least in Australia, the legislation just didn't do all that much. Um, and the reasons for that, um, I, I, what I would take, I think, from your findings, just sort of broadly, would be that in cooperative couples, there's only so many um, who are going to be able to make this work for them, and they're going to do it anyway. That's right. Um, and for uncooperative couples, 
um, courts are likely eventually, perhaps, to understand that this is not, in fact, the best outcome for those sets of families, and therefore they're not going to pursue it, even when they're being encouraged to do so, perhaps, by legislation. Um, and so your conclusion does say you're skeptical about the possibilities for legal reform alone. Um, but um, for me, I, I don't know, I guess I would have liked a little bit more about the, the implications for that. And again, I, I understand you're being cautious in your social scientist way. But that's what we like to do. <laughs> it's funny, it's social science, I, I love trying to build a bridge. That's why I, I hang out with family lawyers. I love trying to build a bridge between law and between social science. And uh, law loves black and white. We do. <laughs> and social science loves grey. And the, the slide that, um, that you know, because I've run out of time, that I just wanted to put up very briefly, is the work I've been doing has been mapping when kids stay mm -hmm. with dad. Mm -hmm. And what this work does, the latest bit of work I've been doing, um, maps the number of transitions. Because mm -hmm. that's an area that's been hardly explored empirically. <coughs> talk about it and the implications of those transitions. Here's 12 transitions in a two-week period. You look at the time switch and you go, my God. But actually, Bob in his books um, notes that um, one-week one week periods where there's a lot of predictability, every Tuesday night, every Thursday night, every Friday and every Sunday, this, these children know exactly where they're going to be each week. It's a highly predictable pattern. So in this paper we've just written, we play around with these things. Now, this is grey. And so the paper ends around how do you create sp space? Forget looking for the best kind of rule or the best this or the best that. How do you create the circumstances to sit down with families and to help them to get new ideas on different ways you can actually share care? So that's where the paper's going. So in a way, um, what I hope to take from this session is to build a bridge back to the original paper by, by Bob, but also to actually try to encourage people to think just a little bit differently about where this grey might fit into the world of, of the law. Um, so, Bruce, so fascinating. I have so many things I want to ask you, but, but I, I guess I'm particularly interested in the, um, I don't know which figure, I think it's this figure three on our handout, where you show that over time, now admittedly these are sort of snapshots in a couple of years, but your groups of the, that, yeah, that one, just go back. No. Um, so the decrease in conflict in the, in the, the yeah. ones with the shared custody. Just wondering, how much does that overlap with the introduction of the family relationship centers? And do you, do you have evidence in that in these interviews about people saying, well, we went to the family relationship center and that helped us with this? Or? So the AFES evaluation, um, which I'll mention in the paper, um, <coughs> maps legal process with some of these things. We can't do that because that's not what, our study is actually a study of the impacts of child support. But we've oversampled shared time to play around with this, this issue. Um, the question is, you know, what's this about? When the 2006 legislation first hit, there were wild judgments. There were kids under five flying between capital cities twice a week. Uh, it actually looked like child abuse to me, but I wouldn't say that in public. Um, some of the judgments were just wild. The truth was, the <coughs> complexity, um, shared parental responsibility, and if that's ordered, then you must consider equal time. So, and then if that's not ordered, then you, look, you must consider substantial or significant time. No one sort of understood it. Um, and so I think what happened was, there was this period of about a, a year to two where a lot of wild things were happening, and all of a sudden some research came out of, do a lot of work with Jen McIntosh, we did some work on kids under five and showed that actually shared time is not a good idea for kids under four. And as the research from Australia was coming out, I think judges and other things around research translation, it started to hit the ground and reality started to bite. And then here's the picture. So that's just one hypothesis. Um, but it's a, it is an interesting story of how do you explain that. While you're on that chart, um, to what extent is it clear that conflict is decreasing and might it be that fewer conflict families are choosing joint custody? I, I guess I'm not yes. quite sure how to read this. Yes. Um, you put it together with the other chart, the, the numbers go down, right? Yes. It's like this peak. In, yes. So. Uh, um, I have to admit there are, um, there are a number of kind of complex demographic shifts running through this data that we haven't fathomed yet. They're actually very, even though the pictures are simple, the complexity of, of the changing the time variant changes going on, we haven't, 
resolved and, and because of the time frame of this conference and the paper, we're just trying to get the data moving and trying to work through mm -hmm. what these might mean. So that would be an important thing, it seems yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, just to clarify, is it, um, and pick up on on uh, Kate's point, is is it fair to say that one interpretation is that as as much fewer shared parenting um, orders that as judges issued through fewer shared parenting orders that they were sorting high conflict that's from right. low conflict cases and that's why you're seeing in 2011 the is that that's a fair right. interpretation right. yeah not they're getting along better <laughs> <laughs> you just mentioned that. offhand that you had research that shared parenting isn't good for kids four and under is that what yep. you said can, yep. can you just Elaborate on that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sneak that in. Bob, do you want to say something about that? Uh, yeah. No, no, it's all yours. <laughs> you get the mic. Um, it's funny. We we used a large population data set in Australia, I think called the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children. And my colleague Jen McIntosh, who many of you might know, who does a lot, is a developmental psychologist, and we crunched these data and. Uh, Jen was very clever. She looked at um, variables that related to attachment. So she put an attachment lens on these variables. There's, there's just data everywhere. And what we found was that kids under four who were in, you wouldn't call it shared time because kids, I think our categories were um, at least one night a week for a child under aged zero to one. Um, and then it was, I think, three nights a week for kids aged three to four. And what we found was there were certainly some very strong signs that those kids actually weren't travelling very well. Surprise, surprise. Um, this paper hasn't been published. There's a government report, the government funded the research, and uh, we're having a lot of trouble publishing the paper for a whole lot of reasons, which I won't go into. But we've <laughs> received some pretty nasty, ferocious attacks around the, the paper and the data. Um, from a range of sources. It's one of those areas that we've strayed into and I just can't believe the, uh, the vitriol that's flowed from this piece of research. Can we get a copy of that? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. So if, if I could add to that, this is the reason why he's, Bruce wants to toss it to me is this is a hugely, hugely controversial issue. It was the lead issue at the meeting of, last meeting of Association of Family and Conciliation Courts very, very hot. Four studies now in the world, because when I was in Australia three years ago, okay. Bruce and Jen told me about the study, I came back and sought to replicate it here and actually did replicate it uh, and find, with a better measure of attachment actually, that you do, you do have increased attachment insecurity if infants under age one are spending at least one night a week away from the, uh, the primary mm -hmm. caretaker. This, it, this is a whole another issue here on just the politics of getting things published. I, I just got mine finally accepted for publication. I didn't talk about it publicly because I didn't want certain groups to know that this data was out there because they were going to make sure it didn't get published, which is what's happening. Are, are there certain groups the father's right? I, I feel like this would be an interesting thing to talk about to the extent it's permissible to talk about. Where, the, where is the pressure coming from? Is it Father's group? Well, there are academics and there are academics, and of course, academics have um, different positions on things. <laughs> that's, very, that's very vague. <laughs> so, is it father's? Where, where is your paper coming out? My paper's coming out in Journal of Marriage and the Family, which is a very well respected, kind of in between sociology and psychology journal. Peer reviewed? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Please. That's all they do. Yeah. No, no, I know. I'm just With a saying, I'm just saying yeah. yes. It's easier published yes. in a law review. Oh, oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's unlike a law review. That's right. right. Yeah, and, there, and there's, yes, the, the pressure against this is coming from father's groups now. And, and again, in the world that I live in most of the time, the father's groups are much, much more vocal and um, influential. And it comes back to parent alienation. I've got a paper that I'm trying to get published on parent alienation that actually shows that if you, your mother's a bitch, it doesn't make you closer to me, it makes you more distant from me. But the alienation people don't like to hear that. So that one's not getting published. So well, this is a whole is, politics issue. Sorry. 
<laughs> Emily. Emily. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just really striking. I have never been at a conference where people had data that they studied seriously and could get peer reviewed and published who feel like it's even a little bit uncomfortable to talk about that, let alone to actually achieve publication. This is, I mean, this is it's really distressing. It's, 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 so you're afraid people. one of us will, will talk to, uh, I mean, that you don't you don't want to talk about it publicly because it's... Uh, well, we're trying to get it published. And, yeah. and, it's been, and the problem is that um, there are certain um, famous academics who peer review articles, mm -hmm. who recognize things, and that whole political process. I mean, publication's a game. It's hard, yeah. It's, and it's once crazy. they recognize the authors and the, and the name, the way, you know, away they go and so we've mm -hmm. we've been knocked out twice now we're actually trying to work out Jen's wondering what we're going to do and I'm saying we must publish so anybody engaged in an expose about that that it's really strikingly that has you happened actually academy. you know Jen Schemes article on the psychopathy that they're, they're, this kind of political yeah. opposition to to publication is ha, ha, happens I mean uh -huh. there's a a, a kind of a famous case that got exposed, and then the American psychologist caved and published the published the article. But it in in response to pressure, it had not done so. On the substantive side, of, yes, <laughs> this not is, the politics. I mean, this is quite important. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or, or can can we get access to these papers? Can we get it the site when they're published? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. If you wear a bag of your pants. Well, Bert, well, Bert, Bert, your, your, your report is out. Our report's out, um, so I can, I can make that available, the government report. We actually got it peer reviewed, so it wasn't a blind peer review. Before we let it out, because we knew that the findings were a bomb, we actually organized for a, a, a non-blind peer review. So we had two scholars who knew the data well to punch as hard as they could. Um, but the bottom line is, until it gets published in the peer review journal, we're actually not going to be able to get the credibility that the paper needs. Hmm. Um, That's just awful. It's, it, it, my, my paper will I, be updated this year. Am, am, I, am I correct in, in my impression that, that shared parenting is defined to be 14% of time? No, I mean, I thought I was 35. No, it's no but I'm, no, I'm, I'm 14% allows an adjustment in oh, support. Right. I, I, allows an adjustment in child support. That seems amazingly yeah. small amount of uh, of time to change the child support level. Yeah, one other way. Is it correlated with the amount of the adjustment? Is it like one seventh pro rate or whatever? Yeah, it's twenty four percent of the of the net cost of the child basically because we move to income shares, mm -hmm. and then once you get to thirty five percent, it becomes a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that change that's, is that's, that's remarkable. A, it's a big change. Very much so, and where the project that, that these data come from is looking at the impacts of those changes, and that's why I've been so interested in strategic bargaining, wondering whether this change would lead to a rise in bargaining. Um, but the problem that we have with our bargaining data is there's so much noise around misinformation. It's not an easy thing to actually find bargaining in a quantitative sense with all of that noise going on. But your definition of shared parenting is 35%. It's 35%, yeah. yeah. I'm running on 30% here because I want to do pre-reform, post-reform, so to be consistent, <coughs> all the data is sitting at 30%. Which might, so, in our, I mean, that might be considered a standard custody visitation arrangement. Mm -hmm. Even up to 30% here, right? Except in California, for child support purposes where yeah. you pay less support for every day the child spends with the other parent. Yeah. The, the thresholds are just are fascinating in the, the, the right. I, I believe it's 120 days a year in Virginia. Virginia it's 90. 90, it, it, now? 90. Oh. In Indiana it's 54. North Dakota it's something like 170. It's just you know it's just a fascinating study in its own right how the states differ. So there's a paper in 2005 that, that I cite by Venor and Griffith that actually has a table that sets out um, the parenting time adjustment thresholds, and it goes as low as one night. Uh, yeah, well, that's what California. The one night, I think, one night a year. There's, there's one state that's. No. Well, California is day one. Day one. So yeah. if it was, right. I mean, nobody gets one night a year of visitation, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. 
Hmm. So, so, so back to the thing. So I, I just want to say I, for you all to appreciate, this is by far, far and away the best data anybody has ever put together on joint custody. It's and amazing. so it was worth the ride down having you talk <laughs> to you. So, um, and and I, I'm very heartened by the decrease in the prevalence of custody in high conflict cases right. and judicial decision making. It sounds like they're doing the, the right thing. But th then my question is, is how does this play in Australia? Because if I'm a father's rights advocate in Australia, I say, those damn judges aren't doing it, right? They're still against us. We need to get rid of the equal cutout. You know, we, it has to be absolutely equal. You think, is that what's going to happen in Australia? Because gender politics have changed, so the kickback on our shared time legislation in 2006 is in 2011, there's been violence legislation. And that's kind of changed the whole ball game mm -hmm. politically. So gender politics are actually cutting across all of this. And so dads are having to move to a different place now, running different arguments um, around violence. So it's, it's shifted the game. Jana? I was also fascinated by the sharp drop in cases that are going the courts yeah. and I was um, wondering about the translatability so my, my question is you know Australia do you need a judicial order in order to change your status from married to not married because I, I talking to Jen I thought maybe not so nah. yeah so so a big so that's like a conundrum here that part of the reason I think why so much of this goes through the court system mm -hmm. is you nah. cannot get divorced without a, a judicial decree. Yeah. So how do people do that in Australia if they don't need it from a court? Um, you put a form in, it gets rubber stamped, and that's that. Wow. Well, wow. So, wow. Or worth considering. <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> unceremonial. Not necessarily. You just file it. It's administrative. It's administrative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, how we do same-sex relationships at major right. employers. They you file and you unfile. And, yeah. I think um, I, I had the same reaction as Kim. I think it's pretty interesting how little change this, this law, which seems to be very supportive of, yeah. of shared parenting, joint custody, has, has, uh, has led to. And it, it seems as, bo as though both parents making their own decisions and courts are are not really sort of moving in large numbers toward toward that arrangement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, we we're, we're stunned by these data. We've checked them 500 times, it's to be honest. It's remarkable. Can that's you speak it. to why you think that's the case? No. I have I have an explanation. Oh, I just want to introduce that as a question. Another factor that might have <coughs> these are over total percentages of divorces. Is that right? What, so, so I'm just wondering whether marriage rates figures into any of this. No, no. So I'm these are um, these are basically people who separate or have never lived together to have a child. Whether they're married or not. Yep. That's the same. That's right. The same that's right. Okay. okay. Last question. Buffy. I, I just I have an explanation for this, this trend, which is that 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 parents tend to want to replicate the the childcare arrangement that they've had during their during their related like, surprise that that's my interpretation. But the the data certainly does does seem to support it, and and I would guess that in Australia, mothers are primary caretakers more than shared parenting during intact. Uh, relationships is is the model and and I guess I'm not so surprised that that um, that after after the yeah. relationship breaks down they perpetuate that. That's what they do. That's right. another yeah. piece of that is I just heard you say that this includes both never married and as the percentage of these families uh, you know the percentage of these families who are never married increases I think that too may play a role because there never there may never have been a um, you know shared parenting. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. so never married is different in Australia. There's more right. there's okay. more cohabitation of yes. long term de facto yes. relationships mm -hmm. have been recognized. Mm -hmm. So it's it's gonna look more like Scandinavian countries than it does here. That's well, this has been a fascinating yeah. session Thank as all know. morning has been. Um, I'd like to see if we could um, 
in 10 minutes have everybody meet their personal needs and grab a lunch <laughs> and be back here really at noon to um, to eat. Bob won't mind us eating in front of him, I'm sure. Really? Yeah. That's fine. We'll go from there.